your grace, your presence, and your power this morning because of your unlimited love for us. And I thank you, God, that even as we worship you, even as we praise you, though we think maybe to do you an honor, God, it is really for us because we so need you and your presence in our lives. And as we draw near to you by faith, by singing, by praising, by worshiping you, not that you need it, but you deserve it because of who you are. And that it really brings us to that place of recognition of you and who you are in our lives this morning. We thank you, God, and as we do that, you'll draw us near to you because you promise that when we draw near to God, he draws near to us. So we thank you for that faith, and we believe and receive it in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. God's presence. And God, just because right now we recognize your presence, we recognize the ability that you have to change our lives. And for us just to simply be changed. So even now in this time, in this place, in your presence, God, we just believe for you to change. Change the things about us that need to be changed. Change the way that we look at things, the way that we see things, our perception of what goes on in life. And right now, cause it to be all about you. That our, our observation of your greatness would cause our perception of all the other things to just diminish. And that we would only see you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 How many see him as your provider? Amen. Amen. Yeah. No matter how many got a job and got an income of some sort. Yeah. yeah. That's not our provision. Is it? That's just that's just a small means of God's provision for our lives. Amen. Amen. How many know you can have the highest paying job in the world, lose your health and try to do everything to get it back and only to spend your fortune just trying to get back yep. that little piece of life that you have left or the greater part of it that you still want to live going ahead. But you know, not, money is not the only answer, amen. amen. And time, you know, you can spend all, of, you can have all of your time used up with money and with your pursuits, but you can also just spend some time with God and his presence. And that's the most useful time we have in our lives. Amen. amen. Well, I see Kat, you've done some of the things that my wife would normally have done for us we had a sign up list. May 20th. Mm -hmm. May 20th. Here, we'll put it up here just in case anybody needs to go over to the stage. May 20th. Uh, just for that hour. Hi. Work. All right. So we have name and dish. Now, this isn't meant, meant to just diminish our intelligence here, but we do need food. Don't bring, <laughs> okay. don't bring an empty dish here. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, no empty dishes, only full ones. So bring something good. Sam, you know what makes what best, right? Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. All right, well, Belfast, you know what Sam makes best, don't you? You're going to write that in for him? <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, make sure that you write something in on that. That's the 20th. That's not, that, that is a Sunday, but it's not mm -hmm. next. It's the one following. So, uh, we have some ambassadors from uh, the Wind family here. Can you share with us what you've got for us this morning? Yes, I have two gifts to my mom's comedy show. Um, the Mother's Day comedy show is next Saturday. Um, and it's at 6 p.m. Um, if you want to buy the tickets, they $10, but if you want to buy them after the door, they're 15 Yes, so you got 50% savings right here. So, um, I got my wallet and I came prepared. So, just be sure that I don't miss the opportunity and that I'm setting a good example for all others. Mike already got his, so here's mine, and that goes to her. Patient does it. How many know that? Our faith begins. That's that's where it begins. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. But before we do, let's open up uh, with Mark here. We stopped last week in what verse? Anyone remember? This is the interactive part. Get me off the hook. Yeah. No, we, we left off in verse 19, and uh, this is after the cursing of the fig tree, and then Jesus drives everyone out of the temple, you remember that? Um, and then at, after this temple experience, they're coming back now, and uh, after, remember they were in Bethany, then they went to Jerusalem, and then they're, they're going back to Bethany, and uh, that's, you remember the, the Bethany or... Uh, the other, the other town, both of them had to do with big. So this is kind of the big country of the area. So uh, they're going back to Bethany, and uh, Peter draws Jesus' attention over here on verse 20. He says, 
Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw that the fig tree had been dried up by the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. I always thought that was a little funny. Because, uh, you know, Jesus, it, it's kind of like, I almost imagine Peter as some sort of a, a childlike surprise. Look, Rabbi, the tree that you cursed has withered, you know? And I can just imagine Jesus kind of in, inside, probably not exterior, externally, but inside rolling his eyes and saying, yep, yeah, I remember cursing it, Peter. Thanks for the update. Captain Obvious there. So um, he goes on and he says, uh, Jesus entered uh, uh, and said to him, have faith in God. Now some translations may be different. Can I see somebody whose hand has a translation that is different from this on this verse? It says, have faith in God. This is in uh, chapter 11. 22. And we are in verse uh, 22. So tell me what your says on there, real quick. Just, just shout it out, loud as you can. Have faith in God. Okay. No, no, no other translations. I know that one translation has a habit of saying "have the faith of God." Yes. So uh, is that what your says, or one translation? Anyway. Uh, regardless is uh, it it would probably be the best application to say have the faith of God as it were because obviously as we go through this we'll see that we don't really have anything to offer this ourselves that we do definitely need God to impart into us to be able to believe things of the supernatural so uh, with that in mind let's keep on saying he says for assuredly I say to you whoever says this mountain be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes those things which he says will come to pass he'll have whatsoever he says therefore I say unto you whatsoever things you desire when you pray believe that you receive them and you shall have them so um, this is an interesting kind of a, a, a group of verses here uh, mostly because when we talk about great faith I, I know it preaches good you know, great faith is a good thing to preach on. And everybody would be excited about preaching on good faith. On, on great faith, rather. But here's, here's the interesting thing. Is that there's a couple of uh, 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 things here that are basic to every kind of expression of faith. And whatever it is, I'm sorry. In the verse 23 it says, Whosoever says to this mountain, okay, so there's a, there's a, a spoken aspect of faith, right? He says, Whosoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea, and doesn't and believes, I'm sorry, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, he'll have whatever he says. So uh, as I'm as I'm saying that, I'm thinking of Mark, I'm sorry, of Romans, which says, When you believe with your heart and speak with our mouth that we are saved, right? So that carries over what Jesus is saying here. It seems to be a broad application of faith is believing in our hearts and corresponding expression with our mouth. Now, James talks about faith without works is dead, right? One translation says faith without corresponding action or supportive action, something that demonstrates that what you believe is meaningful, is, is rooted on the inside of you that results in, in corresponding action. You doing something. Now most of us, the easiest thing to do is to say. We can express our faith. In other words, what we believe, we can express our supporting or corresponding action is speaking. Simplest idea is that if you say that you are a Christian, you profess, you speak that. Remember Jesus saying, if you confess me before men, right? So there's an aspect of confession, right? If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. Now, these things ex tell us the importance of both believing in our hearts and expressing with our mouth. One of the most damaging things to faith in general is when people try to solely internalize it. When suddenly they become like, if I, I was out sharing uh, 
cards to church and making invitations to people to come to church. And I left one on a car windshield, and I got a call from this lady. Now, most of the time, you hope that it's a call that somebody says, hey, that was really awesome. Thanks for inviting me. I would like to come visit. You know, that's the kind of thing you want people to respond. That wasn't the kind of response I got. The kind of response I got was she got my car, she took it out, she called me, and she said, isn't it enough that you Christians can worship alone? Do you have to go on inviting other people? I was like, yeah, that's kind of the thing. You know? <laughs> we express our faith by actually inviting others into our faith. If we all internalized our faith and just made it between us and God, I dare, dare say there would be no church in another couple of years as everybody internalized their faith. It's quite the opposite. Jesus said what? Go into all the world, right? Not stay in Jerusalem and internalize it. In fact, you can, you can make an argument for the fact that the whole reason that persecution came into the church is because they weren't willing to leave. They just came to the day of Pentecost. They all hung out. They all enjoyed the blessing. And there wasn't really much of an intention to go out. When we first started the church in Gainesville that I had, there was a fellow, he owned a bunch of strip, uh, strip mall kind of things, and I asked him if I could use one of them to start the church in. And he was Jewish. And so uh, I thought, well, that's, you know, doesn't really matter. God will give me favor with whomever I need it. And so I walked in there, and he said, uh, I'd, I'd like to talk to you a little bit. So I said, sure. And he told me about some of his life experiences and everything. And he told me, you know what's different between us as Jews and you as Christians? I said, well, I'm sure there's quite a few. Why don't you tell me what you're thinking of? And he said, you guys go out and you tell other people. To us, you're either born a Jew and you that's the way you become a Jew, is you're born a Jew. Now, others can come, but they're really not invited. Mm. I was pretty astounding that it's 2,000 plus years later, and the average Jew is sitting across from the table telling me that unless you're born a Jew, you pretty much got no hope of getting on the ends on this thing because they're not inviting people to come in on this. you got to, like, find out about it. And then uh, oh, when, I, when I started the church here, I was looking for a place to meet. And there was this, this uh, building over here, and I forgot to do it. It's Masons. The Masons, right? And uh, so I said, can I use the building? You know, I was willing to go you know, with whatever was open. So I asked him if I could use the building. And uh, he goes, uh, well, uh, you, you, you can, but you've got to be a Mason. I said, well, uh, that's, that's nice. What is that? He goes, I can't tell you. <laughs> I said, you can't tell me. He said, no, you have to ask me, how do I become a Mason? So I thought, this is really goofy, you know. I, I've got to ask this particular question in order for you to tell me about Mason, you know. So I said, how do I become a Mason? <laughs> you know, I'm like, it's so funny. It, wouldn't you, what, if somebody would want to be a Christian, you know, and they said, could you tell me about the Lord, you know, and you said, well, you have to ask me, you know, and you're like, okay, how do I become a Christian, you know, it's like, it's so silly, but anyway, people got their rules and things, and the Jews weren't very apt to share their faith, they were just, you know, this is, we're God's people, this is for us, and, you know, I don't mean to sound too crass, but I guess it's kind of like the rest of the world can go to hell, I mean, Literally, you know, because if you don't have the Jewish connection already, they weren't going to provide one for you. So this is why there was probably, even though the church was primarily Jewish, that primarily needed some kind of an instigation to get them to move out. Because Jesus had said, you will be my witnesses, what, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then ooh, ooh, to the most parts of the world. So there's, a, a, you know, you can't just keep it to yourselves, guys. So... Persecution fell upon the church, and then, of course, one of the greatest evangelists of, of uh, all time was born out of that. And I call him evangelist. He's evangelist. He was prophet. He was apostle. And talking about Paul, um, and he was the biggest persecutor of the church at the time that the church began to pray for him. So, anyway, what does that have to do with where we are, Mark? Not so much. So, let's get back to where we are. Um, I told you it was more of a preach than a teach. You just kind of get a roll here. And I haven't even started with what's on the pad yet, so we'll see where that goes. Alright, so 
there's a there, the the principle of believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth um, is is here. And what really kind of breaks it open to us is verse 24. Whatsoever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So there's this believing that we're receiving before the having, which is not typical. You know, most of us thank people for something they've already given to us after we've received it. But to believe that you receive it before you have it, why, that's completely different, isn't it? And that's what Jesus is talking about. Now, if you think about that, it will radically change the way that we pray. Not that, uh, not that it's going to radically change the accelerated timetable in which we receive things. As a matter of fact, it, there is no timetable offered here. It just says, believe, you receive, and you shall have. The shall part doesn't really fit into our timeline, but yet it is. In other words, there's a guaranteed but not a guaranteed timeline in which we shall have. Now that's the kind of the bummer part for most of us, right? Because we would have liked there been some sort of a time ascribed to this, a timeline. But the believing and the receiving and the having, there's some what we call the mean time, because it can be really mean, you know? But there is the believing, the receiving, and the having. And we do this before we see any results. So instead of going to God and praying for healing, and then if we don't see the healing manifest, we say, well, that wasn't what God wanted. Jesus is actually saying the opposite. He said, believe that you receive it, and you shall have it. Now, if, if the believing and the receiving are a little blind to you, let's do it like this, okay? The believing and the receiving is the part that you do before you see any results, okay? So, if you believe it with your heart, you say that you receive it with your mouth, then you shall have it. In other words, there's the internal part, the unseen part of the believing and the receiving. We speak, thank you, I believe I receive that. I believe I receive That is my continued confession. I believe I receive that, even before I have any evidence of it. And then the evidence for it comes. All right, so let's get to... Uh, this part that I have, uh, and I don't, I won't leave us there. I will come back to Mark in just a minute. But let me, let me give you a barrage of good stuff from the scriptures here that I think will help you out. I'm going to go fast and furious through it. So take some mental notes along the way, maybe some physical notes if you can. All right. The Bible says, "For by grace we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves; it's a gift from God." That's Ephesians. 2, 8. Now, if you were to turn to Ephesians 2.8, you'll see that we're going to go flip-flop around there from Ephesians 2.8, 2.7, even 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, somewhere around there. But you can read some of those in your spare time. But I, you you all are familiar with that. For by grace are you saved through faith. Everybody say, by grace. By grace. Through faith. Through faith. Okay, now, did I say by faith? I never said by faith, right? Neither did the scripture. It says, by grace, through faith. In other words, uh, these two are like a tag team kind of a duo. You know, you can't have one without the other. There has to be the grace and the faith. Now, I was looking at uh, just these words that came, came back to me, a couple of different words. The words were motive, motive, and means. Now, when I say grace, I think of the motive. That's God's grace, his motivation to do salvation for us. Okay? That's motivation. But also there's the means. The means is by faith, by grace. I'm sorry, by faith. In other words, it's by grace through faith. In other words, God's motivation or motive was grace. But the means through which we're able to experience that grace is faith. So there's motive and there's means, and then I got excited about, I've heard that somewhere. And then I remembered all those shows about criminal justice. <laughs> In the US criminal law, means, motive, and opportunity is the most common summation of three aspects of a crime that must be established before guilt can be positively determined in the criminal proceeding. 
In other words, if you're going to, to uh, convict somebody of a crime, you have to prove means, you have to prove motive, and you have to prove opportunity. So, just for the sake of it, let's kind of get those three words down. Means, everybody say means. 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 Motive. Motive. And opportunity. opportunity. Now, we talked about the scripture here in Ephesians, and it gave to us a means, which is faith, and a motive, which was grace. Now, the opportunity will come to us in a minute. That opportunity is Christ. It's the only opportunity God had. Now, at first you thought, well, I talked about convicting a person of something, and that doesn't sound good. I don't want to be convicted of anything. The reality is, is that you were already guilty. And this is a problem that man has uh, to, to understand, that they are guilt by association. You ever heard somebody like talk about guilt by association? You know, you were hanging out with the wrong crowd, they were all smoking weed, so you must have been smoking weed. Guilt by association, right? Uh -huh. I remember when I was in school, I went out, uh, I had lots of friends who were potheads. Anybody went to school, had friends who were potheads, maybe you were the pothead, maybe you were the guy that everybody else was getting theirs from, I don't know. But here's me in school. I hung around with a lot of potheads, and, and uh, I thought they were cool and everything. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I smoked pot, you know, and I inhaled unlike Bill Clinton. <laughs> but um, here's the thing. One day, I was not involved with anybody doing anything wrong. But I happened to have needed a pen for my homework. Literally, a pen. My guidance counselor, who was, who was perched above watching all of the things that went on, for some reason had her eye on me that day. And as I went over to my pothead friend and asked him if I could have a pen, she runs out there, grabs me, and takes me into the office, and calls my mother, and says, there was an exchange of some sort taking place out in front of the school here, and your son was involved in this exchange. I said, I was exchanging a pen. This pen, right here. No, he says it was a pen, but I know the people he's been hanging around with. And I'm sure that was not a pen. I was guilty by association because my friends were potheads and I exchanged a pen from them, which unbeknownst to anyone else, absolutely positively must have been some kind of illegal drug. <laughs> anyway, guilty by association. We don't like to accept the fact that we are guilty by association. We think that we are pretty darn decent. You know, that nobody pops out of the womb and that lives a life that they're trying to be honest and think that they're already guilty by association. But the Word of God speaks to us differently, doesn't it? The Word of God says we are guilty by association. Now, here's something that we don't like to hear. We like John 3.16, isn't that right? Everybody likes John 3.16. Go to football games everywhere, right? So, the funny thing is, though, in two verses later, uh, this is one of my favorites. It says... There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not. Everybody say, does not. Does not. Everyone who does not believe in him has already been judged. Everybody say, already. Already. Already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. Now that's mind-blowing to our carnal minds. We like to think that we're innocent until proven guilty. But the reality is, we are guilty. Period. <laughs> by association. You say, by association. Well, here's the thing. Guilty by association. When Adam sinned, I'm giving you this from Romans. I'm not making this up. When Adam sinned, and this is in the New Living Translation, so it sounds a little different, but when Adam sinned, sin entered the world, Adam's sin brought death, so death spread, I like that, it's kind of like a plague. Death spread to everyone, for everyone sin. How do, you, how do you negate that? With the most wonderful and well-known scripture of all time in John 3, 16, he has two verses later telling you that 
Everyone is already condemned because they have not believed in the only begotten Son. Just wow. Everybody say it. Wow. wow. Now say it backwards. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> like my friend, one time he, he had the preacher said, say it backwards, and some guys that stood in his chair next to him goes, woo. <laughs> Good. All right. So, uh, everyone has already sinned. And here's the interesting thing that Romans 3.23, which says, all have sinned and come short of God's standards. Okay? That, 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 that in itself is, 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 is good as gold. Okay? Here's, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a little side journey just to, to, and I'll bring this back here. Whenever you share with somebody that, you know, you're sharing Christ with them, the reality is, is that when you share Christ with them and you say, this scripture, all have sinned and come short of God's expectations. Use that word, because enough people understand that better. God's high standards, his expectations. Everybody has sinned and come short of God's high expectations. So you say, can you meet God's high expectations? Can you meet the expectations of God? And 99.999% of the people who aren't mentally disturbed would say, no, I can't meet God's high standards. I can't meet God's standards. And we've gone through this before because if you can get a person to understand that the only person that can meet God's standards is God. Right? I mean, some of us are perfectionists. How many thinks that God's uh, a level-headed perfectionist? Yes. You know? Well, a perfectionist has standards, and pretty much they're the only one that can actually ever meet those standards because they're a perfectionist, and their flavor of perfection is theirs alone. Yeah. It's unique. Therefore, nobody can really ever live up to that particular, that particular person's perfection. Now, God has his own perfection. You may think it's one thing, I may think it's another, but that doesn't matter because God has his own flavor of perfection and none of us can meet it. Right? Right. Only God can meet that because it's God's perfection. It's his standard. So knowing that, we know that Jesus is the only way for us to be saved because only Jesus is God and can meet God's standards. Right? Yep. Now the reason I say that is because... Enter into now, we, we understand that we are guilty by association. That the same sin of Adam is the same sin that has plagued everyone after him. That there is no other way out. There was no way. And in fact, uh, the Bible talks about the blood of goats and bulls not being capable of, of redeeming or causing the consciousness of sin to be expelled. In other words, even after a, a, the death of a bull or a goat or something, that was not enough to cleanse the conscience of the sinner. It may have covered the sin, as it were, so that God didn't look at it to judge us, but rather the animal. But our own consciousness could never have been completely rid of sin. Therefore, we can never stand in, in the sight or in the presence of God with a clear conscience. So even if we made it through this life, we'd stand before God, and then God would look searingly through our being and say, I see there that you have a consciousness. There, there, there's no way that you can truly have been free from sin. Your own consciousness shows it right there. You're like, yeah, well, I killed my friend, friend's goat named Harry to cover my sins, but it never really got it out of me, you know? So I can put on new clothes and everything, but I can still be the same old dirty old sinner on the inside. Isn't that right? I am. So that's what the <coughs> law did. That's what uh, nothing else you know, worked for us. There was never a suitable sacrifice that can actually cleanse our consciousness of sin. Although it would, it would cover our sins, but never, never cleanse us from it. All right, so now we first have to look at okay everybody looks at themselves as they truly are through the uh, through the uh, through the the glass of god's word and that we are sinners and that our unbelief has kept us from the grace that god has given to us in other words the only way you miss out on this thing is by never receiving it it's for everyone already done but 
not everyone chooses to receive. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's like forgiveness. God has forgiven us, but not everybody chooses to receive his forgiveness. Frankly, not everybody thinks they need to be forgiven. Isn't that right? Yeah. How many of you sometimes you have an argument with that blessed person in your life? Anyone? Yeah. Only, two, <laughs> only two or three people are listening to me here today. No, it, you have, a, you have a, a, a argument with somebody, and you eventually you'll go into that thing saying, well, I guess I'll say I'm sorry, but I know I'm not wrong. Yeah. Right? Because, you know, and then you, you kind of put a spiritual twist on it and say, I'm going to be the more spiritual one. And I'm going to say I'm sorry, even though I know I have nothing to be sorry. Well, <laughs> the reality is, is that each and every one of us, we need to accept the response, uh, the idea that we truly do need to be forgiven for something. Even if it was something that we did in ignorance doesn't mean it wasn't done. Is that right? And most of us sin ignorantly. How many of you I mean how many of you just sinned ignorantly before you're a Christian? You just go out and you do your thing every day. You know? You're like, if it feels good, do it. Well it's called sin most of the time. But we just do it ignorantly. And that doesn't mean we're not guilty. It just, it just may mean we didn't do it maliciously, but we're still guilty. Amen? All right, so now that we've, associated, we've, we've, we've uh, uh, got the proper mindset, let's rush through uh, the, the things that we talked about in the first three things, which were means, motive, and opportunity. Means, motive, and opportunity. Because we're not, God's not trying to condemn us. We were already condemned. Okay? Now, when it comes to how we can get out of this, we're going to look at it from the means, motive, and opportunity. Quickly, grace is the motive. God's love and His grace. Listen to the scripture in Ephesians. We read from Ephesians 2.8. Did you know that just in Ephesians 2.7, this awesome piece is given to us? It says, God raised up Christ. I put dot, 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 so I didn't have to read the whole thing. So God can point to us in all the future ages, again, this is the living translation, so it's, it gives us a little different perspective, so that God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and of His kindness towards us to show in all He has done for us who are united in Jesus Christ. In other words, grace is the motivation, not just for now, but for forever, so that he might be able to present us as basically the object of his immeasurable grace. Can you imagine that? Do we forever are going to be held up as the, the icon of God's immeasurable grace and kindness? We didn't deserve it. We're held up like a trophy, as it were. And not a trophy of one's personal accomplishments, but the true essence of God in His grace. I mean, I don't know how the trophy feels when He's hoisted up. I imagine it's probably pretty good. You know, nobody ever never asks, I guess, you know? But it's awesome to be that. I'm looking at the little guy at the top of the trophy, you know, and thinking, he must feel really top of the world right now. He's being hoisted up by the best of the best to show her just how good the person that's holding him up truly is. Amen? Amen. And when we're held up like a trophy for all eternity to show the essence of God's grace and kindness for all time, that's a grand feeling, isn't it? That's a grand feeling. All right, so grace is God's motive. Faith is his means. In other words, let me read for you this scripture. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him diligently. Right? So let's break that down real quick. We must believe that God is. In other words, your first, your first experience with faith involves something you can do, which is believe. Okay. Remember we said earlier, by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift from God. And people, scholars go round and round. Is it, are we talking about the grace that is a gift from God? Or are we talking about the faith that is a gift from God? Let me give you my perspective on it, and I believe it's both. So here's why. 
And that is because believing is something I can do. I can do that. But faith, on the other hand, is what God gives when I believe. Okay? Amen. When I believe, God gives me what, he, what the scripture calls, I believe, the measure of faith. In other words, it's the mustard seed. It is where we all begin. It is the starting place. And it enables us to accept the grace that God's given to us. It enables us to accept God's grace. And the, 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 flip, the switch that I flipped on was just, I believe it. I, I just, okay. You know, in essence, I say, okay. I can give you my personal experience in a nutshell real quick. I came in as a, as a, as a significant drug user and brought my mother to church for her to be to church because I did not think anybody needed church except her. Now, there were other people there, but I did not think it was for me. So I went to church under somewhat of an influence of drugs. Probably not, you know, I wasn't like off the rocker or anything. Just, just enough to get me there because that's, that's probably the only way I would have gotten there. So I got, and with, and with my mother, if you knew the dynamic between us, you would understand I have to probably do a little something just to be able to get in the same vehicle, in the same place, and remain in the presence of my mother and take her back home. So I just got to relax her. You know? <laughs> so I had, some, I had something to relax me to get me in that place where I could take her to church and then take her back home and not just, you know, be, yeah, not just feel slain when it was over. So um, as this guy talks, you know, I start their tears start rolling down my eyes, and I'm like, this is really freaky. I have no idea what's going on here. So um, I tried to kind of do this for my mother, you know, and just kind of sit there and do that. And then after it was over, I, I wanted to tell the guy, you know, thanks for talking. You really spoke my heart because I didn't know what the heck else to say. So then he said, uh, can I pray for you? I said, sure. And when he did, he laid hands on me and prayed in some unknown tongue, which also got me to thinking about things that I didn't have any idea what were going on. But I figured I'm already I'm totally not aware of why I'm here and what I'm doing. Might as well just roll with it. So uh, he did that, and then uh, I, I experienced an out-of-body kind of thing where uh, I met the Lord, and then I was born again and came back knowing God was my Father. The reason that I say that is because, really, I only did one thing. I just said, okay. I just, when the guy said, can you pray for me? I could have said, no. I mean, I, I, tears rolling down my face, it doesn't make any difference. Because people can have an experience with God. You can be talking to somebody, and I have. I've talked to people, and I keep on talking to them, and there's tears rolling down my face. I know I really need to do what you say. I know I really need a relationship with Christ. Do you want to pray? No. You know, it's shocking. Because they, they're thinking too hard. They're thinking about something they have to give up or something that has to change or something that they're doing, that consciousness of sin that keeps them. And they're thinking about this thing and they thought it through too much. They didn't believe. The simple believing was just simply saying, God loves me. You're telling me God loves me? Why did all these things happen in my life? No, it's just suddenly a person who says, I can not believe that. You want to pray for me? Okay, I can believe that. I'm willing. And really, that's the only thing we can do. And then God, when, when we believe, faith is imparted to us the measure to receive the grace that God has for us. That grace is just the starting place, and then we finish the race, right? Grace is the starting place to finish the race of grace, all right? But we run, you know, that whole rest of that grace race, if you will, is run by the faith that God gave us right then to believe and continue the race. All right, so what we can do, we can believe. That is why the scriptures say, he that believeth not is condemned already. It didn't say he who doesn't have faith. It didn't ever say anything about faith. Why? Because the faith enters in when somebody believes. That's 
That's all there. No qualifications. No, you don't have to have a, a, a degree. You don't have to understand it before you say yes to it. You just, you just say yes to it. And then isn't that what adoption is all about? When it says that we're adopted in the family of God? I mean, adoption isn't like a mental choice on the, on the part of the orphan. Eh, I don't know. You guys don't look like you got enough money for me to have to be happy. I think I'd rather stay here in the orphan. No, it's not that way. The orphan just sits there and says, "Why, well, yes. I, you know, <laughs> adoption is all about just saying yes. And you can say no in an adoption, but would you be stupid? Yeah, you'd be probably pretty stupid to say no to an adoption and stay in an orphanage. Likewise, all you have to do is say, yes, I believe. When you do that, that part that you can't do, the faith that you don't have. Because faith is experiential in the natural. In other words, I, you're sitting on that chair. You sit on that chair because you have faith in that chair. Not the kind of faith that God gives. You have experiential faith. You sit on that chair because every other chair you sat in bared your weight, or bore your weight, whatever it is, bore your weight. And so now you figure any chair you sit in that looks like that chair will support your weight. Right? It's experiential. But we never experienced God, so we can't use experiential faith. We have to have a gift of faith, the God kind of faith that Jesus taught. I want to close up, and I know I've been longer today because I tried to do both. I have teaching. I have but if I wanted to just finish up with teaching here, let me just read those couple of verses now that I closed the Bible. Read the couple of verses that Jesus said after that. When you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven might also forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And say, Pastor, I really wish you wouldn't have had to leave on that note. Yeah, that just, that yeah, what'd you bring that up for? Um, <laughs> because it's the next verses. But the reality is, is that why would Jesus say that? Why is why is that even sandwiched in this thing? I mean, it sounds so good, and then he sticks that in there, and you're like, dang, that just didn't fit. Why did you say that? Because an exercise of faith, when you have received God's faith, you express that by saying, I reciprocate forgiveness. In other words, you receive forgiveness by faith. Remember that consciousness of sin that we talked about? When you receive faith, it, it just divests your consciousness of sin. It just divests it completely. I got no problem with the things I did because I died. Paul said, Amen. it's no longer I to live, but Christ that lives in me. I, I got that. I understand that concept. I don't, I, I don't understand with my mind. I understand with my heart because by faith, it, by faith, that deposit of knowledge was made on the inside of me. I don't struggle with the things that I did in the past because I died in Christ. And it is now that I'm raised in Him, it's not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. So the person that I am is because of the grace of God, and the way that I know that is the faith that was deposited on the inside of me. So when Jesus talks about forgiveness, He's simply saying this, that if you don't forgive people, it's an evidence that you have not been able to receive forgiveness for yourself. And that is the, the essence of faith. The essence of faith. See, I can forgive people by faith. They don't have to ask for it. They don't have to earn it. Forgiveness is entirely by faith. And if you want to grow in faith, if you want to understand faith, then you have to understand the need to forgive. Jesus talked about, I'm um, sorry, Peter talked about how many times shall I forgive? Jesus told him back, not unto seven, but seventy times seven. In other words, one of the greatest things that you're going to be challenged with is to forgive people. Now, many people are like, well, I don't know, I forgive everybody. It always comes natural to me, and I do this every day. I see that same person driving down the street and shake their fist at somebody that passes them in a hurry. Because forgiveness isn't the big thing that you think it is when somebody did you wrong back in way back when, and it was a really, really big wrong, and you've finally gotten over it. It's that everyday thing like Peter talked about, seventy, you know, how many times shall I forgive? Jesus said 70 times 7. In other words, forgiveness is the, is the most simple way to express faith on a regular basis. You may not be exerting faith for a whole lot of things every day, but you can express it for forgiveness every day up to 777 or whatever, seven times, 70 times 7. What is it? 490. 490. How many of her times 
uh, somebody sins against you today, you can express or you can exercise your faith 490 times a day by just forgiving Forgiving the things that your mate says that you felt were insensitive. Then forgiving the things that, the way people drive. God knows that happens. How many times a day? I mean, don't because you're in the car like how many hours a day? I'm in the car sometimes two, three hours a day. I don't like to do that two, three hours. But that's the way it is. And you know how many people offend me on the road? You know how many people uh, that I take offense to on the road even if they didn't intend to? Because I'm like, that was insensitive. Why do you, you know because we have standards, you know, and people have been. But forgiveness is a, a regular expression of faith. And this is why there's, a, there's, there's the idea that if you don't forgive, God doesn't forgive you. It's not that he, like, holds unforgiveness against you. That's not it at all. It's that if you don't exercise faith to forgive others, you're not exercising faith to receive forgiveness. And the, the teaching was on faith. It wasn't on unforgiveness. So let's put it right, right? Is on faith. In other words, this is all about faith. How can you grow? How can you learn? How can you exercise your faith? Forgiveness. Easiest, simplest way for us to exercise faith. Because forgiveness doesn't come any other way. You're not going to feel like forgiving people. You're not going to even feel forgiven. It's all faith, isn't it? And it's the cornerstone of our faith to both receive forgiveness and then to offer forgiveness. Again, Forgiveness has been given to the world and not received by all. Isn't that right? That's why it's easy for us by faith to forgive all, even when people don't receive it or whether they don't think they need it. Amen? Yeah. All right. Thank you for your ears being a little, uh, a little longer than usual today. Thank you so much. I, I pray that you got something out of that, though, and that you'll be able to uh, look at that differently as you read through it and as you share it with others. Let's go ahead and, and uh, close with our time together. Did you get those sheets around? Did you get to sign up on some of that? And uh, remember, our sisters in the back here are holding the uh, your ticket to an evening of fun. All right? So uh, make sure that before you leave, you get with them, too, and uh, secure one of those so that we can all be there together and support Shannon and our sister. All right. Uh, Kat, you want to just offer up a, uh, a, a prayer of both Thanksgiving and faith for that all Thank you, Father, for your mercy and your grace that leads us to faith in you. And thank you for your provision. And I just pray that everything that comes into your kingdom will multiply um, and just always in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you again so much. God bless you. Thanks for us to enjoy some chips and cheese. And don't forget my wallet. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, God bless you for this time of fellowship. I've enjoyed it immensely. I hope you've enjoyed it and we'll continue to with each other. Amen. Well, it's a mini camera. <laughs> Oh, shit.